thank you. I can share my screen from here, right? Yes. Yes, okay. And let's do that. Yeah. So thank you for this opportunity to present some ideas. Uh, which are obviously um, kind of inspired by uh, Gayatri Spivak, uh, also the title is obviously uh, inspired by Spivak's very famous work, Can the Subaltern Speak? So, um, what I, the, the starting point, uh, my starting point, and this was the base of what uh, Spivak was discussing when she asked for the possibility to speak for a subaltern, is that Truth is not something that is really there and objective, uh, objectively to be assessed, um, but truth is a form of hegemony. It's hegemonic to say what is true and what is not true. Um, so, and this comes out of this post-structuralist understanding, that we only understand the world through discourse and have no direct way to perceive of the world. Um, so a hegemonic discourse is one which is able to link different concepts, different and ideas, different signifiers uh, into a, dis uh, into a uh, discourse with many signifiers, uh, and the link between them is a so-called empty signifier, which is a signifier which is very vague and thus uh, able to link all these other concepts together. Uh, and arguably science, scientific knowledge is something like such an empty signifier. Um, and this possibility to, to link signifiers comes out of plausibility, but probably more out of power relations. Recognition or non-recognition of different forms of knowledge comes out of uh, power relations, uh, um, and especially and important for our debates here, out of global power inequality. Um, Spivak uh, said, as I said before, the subaltern cannot speak, and she explained it in a way that the possibility to make oneself understood, and this is what she means with uh, being able to speak, she doesn't mean being able to talk, obviously, uh, is that you are in an intercourse with society, that you have some kind of existence in society, that you are in a community. And those who are outside of the structure, which is always uh, organized by ideology, they cannot speak, they cannot make themselves uh, understood. Um, so what happens then frequently is that somebody else is speaking for the subalterns, basically people like us, uh, academics. Uh, but this obviously means that the subalterns are kept silent in this way, as somebody else is speaking for them. So the task would be, to enable subalterns to speak, which then means, according to the definition of speak, they are no longer subalterns. Now, one way of doing that, uh, which is, I think, rather prominent nowadays, are so-called identity politics. Uh, and the term identity politics uh, was first mentioned, or I said it was first mentioned, uh, by the Kumbaya River Collective um, of black women who said, I mean, in, as we need an anti-racist uh, politics, we cannot really um, cooperate with white women, and as we need an anti-sexist feminist politics, we cannot really work together with black men, and, and also not with white men. Um, thus, the only one who can really work consistently for our liberation are us. And this is this idea, idea of identity politics. Um, what we see here is a recognition of experiences to say this is a form of knowledge which is important and this has to be acknowledged uh, and at the same time a kind of devaluation of abstract thinking. So this is a way, identity politics is obviously a way to include neglected forms of knowledge and knowledge production but at the same time other forms of knowledge and knowledge production are by definition excluded. So legitimate speech is, comes only out of, the, of our own experiences. And no one else can talk about that. This then means, if we take this really um, to the extreme, that there is no way of finding a common ground. Uh, and also, possibly, that we have a neglection of inner group differences. Um, 
one um, effect of identity politics, which is also rather important nowadays in many countries, including my own in Austria, uh, is the so-called cancel culture, which is actually a polemical term, but it's a polemical negative term, but it is also a rather precise term. Uh, so we have more and more uh, speeches and, and discourses and people actually who are cancelled due to this idea of identity politics. And the example I bring here um, is, uh, I think it's a very interesting one out of my experience, uh, of my assessment, especially because it is so ambiguous. So we have this professor of modern and African history who should talk about colonial history from the perspective of Africans. And it was very clear to everybody that this man really is the expert on the field and also an expert who was really politically active for the voices of Africans and in Africa. He spent a lot of time there. At the same time, he's an old white man. There's no question about that. And so we see this tension. I think I don't have to go deeper into that. If you read that, you can also see that this is the like the, the, the two sides of this coin where they said it is ridiculous that such a guy is not allowed to speak about what he was researching for his whole life. But yeah, uh, it's also clear where the kind of position comes from. Um, so we have a very brief interim summary here. We say that the assertion of truth is based on hegemony, and hegemony uh, now again is based, among other things, on the right to speak and the possibility to be understood. Um, when we now say it is a normative aim, and also an aim in terms of having a better knowledge, uh, that subalterns should be able to speak, does this mean that those who are privileged are not allowed to speak? And also, and this is another question, are all forms of knowledge and knowledge production of the same value? And now this last question uh, played a huge role, I think, in debates during the last years, um, with regard especially to the COVID crisis, the pandemic, and the measures against the pandemic. So um, skepticism against science is something that came up to a higher degree, and certainly was discussed to a higher degree, and many institutions, including my own, the Austrian Academy of Sciences, now are in this um, kind of um, mobilization against skepticism against science. Um, and this is a very difficult, I think, uh, again, a field here. Um, I mean, yes, you can see we have science as a system of gaining knowledge, um, and this system should be trusted. Um, but at the same, same time, I mean, this claim for trust in science is kind of a contradiction in itself. Well, science is based on skepticism. This is how we learn and we develop our knowledge. Um, and this um, mobilization against skepticism, against science, frequently looks as if it should be believed like a religion. And obviously, this is not how science works. Um, and also, and I think here we see also this, this, this relationship to the question of colonialism and post-colonialism, also in knowledge and knowledge production. The scientific method, that is usually understood, um, is one which is objective, which can understand reality um, by rational explanations, um, so that we, by observation and skepticism, can develop and further develop our knowledge all the time, you know, by hypothesis and testing the hypothesis and so on and so forth. Um, however, there, there, there are many, many um, ways of, of uh, doubting uh, this understanding of science. Um, and one of them, for instance, was brought up by Thomas Kuhn uh, quite some time ago when he talked about paradigm shifts in science. And when he kind of proved also that there are these shifts, where actually we cannot see a linear progress or anything like that, but really massive changes which bring us to um, develop knowledge in a completely new way, to have new understandings uh, which we didn't think about before, um, so that somehow of consensus of us a new consensus of scientific community develops. Um, and which means we have competing uh, understandings of reality in science. So, and this again shows that science has a lot to do also with subjectivity and subjective understandings of scientists, of academics. Um, yeah. Um, and when we look at this, 
quotation a bit lengthy one, but I think it's interesting because it's a quotation by a physicist who in fact is saying what I said at the beginning about this post structuralist understanding of a hegemonic discourse. That's the scientific method is a key word and it's, it's a key word because we do not know exactly what it is. There is some kind of common sense that uh, we kind we understand what it means, but there is no clear agreement about that. And precisely by that, this is a very good tool to bring us together and to say, okay, we agree that the scientific method is very important. And arguably this hegemonic agreement was up to some degree um, disturbed by new discourses which came up more prominently than before during the pandemic. I mean, they have been here for a long time, every single every kind of doubt of the scientific method. So now the question would be, if we look at science as such a hegemonic concept, can we then think of making it more open, also to include subaltern knowledge? Um, and I would say the main problem that we have here is this, and I mentioned that already, this idea of rationality, which is very a very important base of our Western thought on science or on knowledge in general. This idea that human beings can be rational, are rational, and have objective interests at the core of their soul. Um, and this is a universal principle. I mean, it was brought up as a universal principle by the Enlightenment. And as it goes with universal principles, it was used to exclusion, to exclude some people and positions and what have you. Um, and we had these exclusions due to racism and sexism. You know that for quite some time women were excluded from that because we were able to think rationally. And then there's the racist idea that some people and some forms of knowledge production are not rational. Um, and then you can also have this kind of temporary exclusion saying, okay, they are not, still not rational, but they will become so we can educate them. Um, so we have rationality arguably as a concrete societal system uh, a system that, among other features, is also an imperialist capitalist system, uh, and it is a system of oppression, among other things. It's also a, a system of knowledge production, obviously. And at the same time, I think we have at least this feeling that not every argument is of the same weight, and that not every opinion is of the same, uh, really is leading to knowledge. So the question is, how can we then differentiate? How can we say this is legitimate and this is not? And this brings me to, 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 to my last slide and my kind of uh, conclusion, which is not very satisfying, um, uh, if I say so myself, uh, but rather opens up lots of other questions. Um, but I think, I mean, that the only way to, to approach in this problem is not to have an absolute idea, neither of rationality nor of saying it is just about identity and our own experiences, but to deconstruct, especially this concept of rationality, because it is so important in our thought, and deconstructing doesn't mean destructing, huh? it means to, to, to keep up the concept but to doubt it all the time. And instead of a common ground to um, start up from the fiction of the possibility to understand each other. Um, in terms of methods to acknowledge different forms of argumentation, like for instance storytelling, which is more important in other cultures, arguably, than in the, in the, in the cultures of the global north, um, but still to insist on some form of argumentation, which is something different from just uh, uh, saying that something is like that. Um, and to quote Hannah Arlen, to train one's imagination to go visiting. And I guess this would mean that we do not have a previous preference of one form of knowledge or knowledge production, but on the other hand, that we also don't start from the assumption that all forms of knowledge production are of the same value. Yeah. And I absolutely agree that this is not a very clear-cut argumentation that I'm finishing this, but um, yeah, maybe we can get there during our discussions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Monica. 